Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for an encore presentation. Uh, we're happy to have you all here. Let's go ahead and get started. My name is Carrie Bourne. I'm from the Office of Continuing Education at UW Whitewater, and we host the Fairhaven Lecture Series here at Fairhaven Senior Services, and we've been doing so since 1983. Um, and this semester, we're focusing on the world of the arts, so all of our lectures have an art-related theme. Um, and today's is about music and about talent, which is great. So let, let me introduce today's speaker. Benjamin Whitcomb is professor of cello and music theory at UW-Whitewater, where he has received awards for his teaching, research, and service. An active recitalist and chamber music musician, he performs frequently throughout the country and abroad. He is a member of the Encora String Quartet and the UW-Whitewater Piano Trio. His solo CDs are available from MSR Classics. Benjamin is a prolific author, having published dozens of articles in six different journals and presented over 30 papers at national and international conferences. He has contributed to three books and published 10, including the Advancing String Players Handbook Series, Cello Fingerings, and Bass Fingerings, all of which have received rave reviews from String Magazine Plus, the journals of Asta and Asta. More recent books include the Compendium of Chords series and the Guide to Practicing Popper Etudes. Benjamin's cello students have won uh, numerous awards locally and nationally and have pursued graduate degrees at leading institution. Benjamin is very active in the American String Teachers Association, having served as Wisconsin State President, National Secretary, Chair of several committees, and Articles Reviewer for the American String Teacher. At UW-Whitewater, Benjamin initiated and continues to coordinate the Theory History Colloqui Colloquium Speaker Series, the Musical Mosaics Concert Series, and the Summer String Camp. He is a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin and Oklahoma State University, and has studied with Phyllis Young, George Nykrug, and Evan Tonsing. Please welcome Benjamin Whitcomb. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're uh, doing this uh, a second time in part because the just the recording the previous time didn't catch it all and so this way we'll have the whole thing so hopefully this time my presentation will eclipse what I did last time I don't, sorry all right so in the music field we run across the word talent an awful lot one gets accused of having talent one hears about another person's level of talent or not and the word talent is used in a way that is sometimes, sometimes means skill and sometimes means inspiration and sometimes means something that people are perceiving that, they're, that they were born with versus what they acquired over time. And so, I don't know, just whenever, as a teacher, the teacher in me doesn't like a word hanging out there that gets used a lot, that has so much just kind of vagueness to it. So... I want to talk about it today, and I want to see if by the end of the presentation, maybe we have at least somewhat of a different view of this term, what it means and how we get it. So manufacturing talent is an expression that one of my own teachers used, and I think intentionally used the word manufacturing for almost kind of like the, the shock factor, because we don't usually think of this as something that is manufactured. Um, but it definitely relates to m the way that I think about when I'm teaching my cello studio. So we have to start with what is talent. The Oxford Dictionary, as good of a dictionary as any, refers to it as natural aptitude or skill. This word natural is going to come back a few times. So what does natural mean? Does natural mean genetic? Does it mean that you're born with it? Uh, and then another thing that, I mean, I didn't get a quote that specifically refers to the, the mystical properties of talent. But often when people are writing about talent, they have kind of an awe for this, this uh, kind of beyond, beyond what we can explain. Somebody just has a certain level of talent, and I couldn't do that because I'm not talented. So in, in some ways, I almost think that it's intentional that just like some people like to keep an aura of magic in art, we want to keep maybe that same mystique in the way that we acquire the ability to perform art. 
So what is the difference between talent and skill? So from thesaurus.com we have, talent is generally used to refer to something that someone is naturally good at. There's that word again. While skill is generally used to refer to something a person becomes good at through practice and training. So that's one of the things that I think gets me is the degree to which you work extremely hard. You work very, very hard at something. And then when it just gets attributed to talent, it's as though, well, you were born with it, I wasn't. You have it, I don't. Like, you don't know how hard I worked to get to this, to being able to be called talented. All right, so can hard work make you more talented? There is Malcolm Gladwell's, I think, fairly famous by now book, uh, Outliers, that uh, ascribes the idea that it takes 10,000 hours of doing something to be an expert. And yet, I know we can all think of situations in which somebody has gotten to the expert level in a fraction of that time, or some people who have spent much more time than that and not gotten to the level of expert. American String Teachers Association referenced in my bio every year, actually just a week and a half ago, I got to go to the national conference and they bring out some seven or eight or nine year old to play Cap Paganini Caprices just flawlessly. Now, is that that they are talented? I don't think so, and I'm gonna get to that. So, so could we improve our technical competence and sound natural at it, or is it somehow affected, you know? that we're just doing something that we've been told to do, and it still has this artificial quality to it. Talent in the arts versus other fields. The arts is by no means the only area in which we hear the use of the word talent. We can hear about a talented pitcher or something like that in a lot of sports. The artistic and technical skills within the arts, again, I just want to emphasize that, that there is a, a high degree to which people think of it as something that inherently is ununderstandable. It is mysterious. So a little bit about the insider game of uh, cello playing, just because it'll help when I have, I brought a student today, Nathan Ott, is going to demonstrate some things for us. We are small muscle, muscle athletes, are often referred to as athletes, but with smaller muscles. A lot of instrumentalists become athletes with all of the little tiny muscles in the hands, for example. And then within the string world, when you think about the motions of watching all the violin section or the cello section when we're playing a box suite or what have you, uh, of course, a dancer would be dancing with all four limbs. Sometimes our left hand gets to dancing a bit, but our right arm, we actually often use the verb choreograph. We choreograph our bow motions, uh, just like a dancer would. Something to think about as a, as a parallel art. The cello has been described by all the orchestration books I can think of as being the instrument with the timbre closest to that of the human voice, to a tenor human voice. And this, this, I think, affects a lot of the ways that uh, composers tend to write for us cellists. And then just one other thing to think about context-wise. The next time, if you're thinking about this talk maybe while you're at a symphony concert and watching the cello section extra closely, we, we, we wear different hats. So sometimes we're playing the lowest, the, the roots of the harmonies, the bass line. Other times we get the melody. And sometimes we're doing something in, intricate in the middle along with the violas or, or the clarinets or what have you. All right, just a little bit of cello nuts and bolts. Okay, back to talent. The role of habits. I think part of what makes us think of talent as being something that you're either born with or you're not is that we all developed a certain number of talents, the, t the uh, excuse me, habits. The habits that'll get you are the ones that you aren't aware of. And some of the habits that you're not aware of are the ones that you developed before you can now remember. I don't know how many of us can remember when we were one year old, but we were doing things when we were one year old. And our brain is remembering how to tell certain muscles to do certain things when we're that age, whether it's grab something or, or manipulate things. And we tend to do it that way for the rest of our lives. Uh, 
part of what we're trying to do in teaching a skill like string playing is take areas that are hidden from the brain and, or done um, just by chance, unwittingly, and make them intentional as well. Habits, were informative. Habits and coordination. So sometimes when we try to learn a new habit, if somebody teaches you a different way to tie your tie or something new, one of the things that can immediately make us think that, oh, I can't do that, is the element of coordination. And coordination is controlling actions with respect to each other over time. So we very often, when we're trying to create more talent than what uh, was previously in an aspect of a student's playing. We're going to do it very much in slow motion. We do slow practice to heighten our awareness and to go through a mental checklist of everything that we're doing and in what order. I need to move here and then this bow goes there. I need to know the order. And notice I didn't say we practice slowly. We don't practice slowly. We practice in slow motion. So that distinction is when you watch that replay of the touchdown catch, it's in slow motion because we can still see all the momentum that's going to be there when it goes back to full speed. Whereas if I just do something slowly, it doesn't have to have any momentum to it at all. We need that feeling. The momentum is how the one domino is going to fall into the next domino. We're just doing it slowly enough that we can work in our conscious intention in each one of those steps. <clears throat> All right, these are three things that, oof, they really bug me. Enemies to virtuosity. So if any one of these things is the case with you, if you come to study cello with me, the first thing that we have to do is clear them out of the way because they are going to be roadblocks to our ability to create anything resembling skill or talent in any aspect of your playing. So perfectionism, for example, I think is just a, a horrible thing. I don't know why humans are possessed by the idea that we, we should have this right to expect perfection out of, out of something that we do. And then we beat ourselves up mercilessly if we aren't perceiving ourselves as being perfect. And it's a horrible thing. And in fact, over the years, not only do I like to take students who think of themselves as perfectionists and disavow them of that, I want to, I want to convince them of the virtues of mistakes. So this is, think about this. Again, attitudinally, there's a distinction here to be made. Sometimes perfectionists will go, okay, yes, I've been told that mistakes are inevitable. Mistakes are gonna happen. But I'm trying to go much further than that and say that mistakes are how you learn and you learn faster by making more mistakes. This process of experimentation, when you think about watching a, a toddler learn how to walk, they're, they're doing all sorts of things wrong, but you let them find out for themselves and each one of those mistakes is the source of a faster rate of learning than if they are trying to do everything just perfectly every single time. It's debilitating. Speaking of debilitating, so is indecision. We can never have indecision in the performing arts. When we go out on stage, you cannot be indecisive. If you don't know this evening, you may honestly not have an opinion whether you want Mexican or Italian or Chinese. And that's perfectly okay. You might just flip a coin or leave it up to somebody else. But when you go out on stage, you have to want Italian or whatever it is. And you have to believe that that's the only thing. So this is a type of, this is a new, this is a habit too. This is a habit of thinking where you commit to something and you do so with absolutely all the conviction you can muster as if your life depended on it. Because, of course, your life does not depend on it when you're performing on stage, but it sure feels like it. That thing that we call adrenaline, this powerful chemical that can make a several hundred pound deer go from just calmly eating grass to running at 30 miles an hour that fast, that's one powerful chemical. And it's just all through your system when you're on stage. You cannot have any indecision. So we have to remove that too. All right, and then brute force. What's the point of brute force? We just 
try and get through a wall and just pound and pound on the wall, but there's a door right there. You look for the door. There are just times where if you're trying to get the lid off the pickle jar and you just, you in life, you, you just go get pliers. You just go get pliers and it comes right off. It's not cheating to do that. So part of what we're doing in the practice room and in lessons is creating a, a kind of a toolbox, if you will, of ways to have pliers and hammers and screwdrivers and all these tools to go around the problem rather than just through force of will make it happen. <clears throat> very, very antithetical to everything else that we're trying to do. These three things, beware. Creativity and inspiration. This is one of these things where now I'm in some of the things I'm going to have Nathan do. I'm going to try and have a mix of some, some technical things where you're going to say, wow, how, how would I do that? Oh, does it really boil down to that simple of motions? But then there's the emotion side of thing where some people think, I'm only going to be able to be truly profoundly moved by somebody who has that artistic talent. And I don't believe that either. I think part of why we think that is because when we hear, let's say, it could be a son or daughter, niece, nephew, grandson, granddaughter, whatever, and they, we hear them and they sound scratchy on their instrument, and, they sound, and the tone's not so bad. And then, hey, that's, that's, some, that's some, really improved some, but you're still not moving me. And then suddenly there's a point where I am moved, and I think that that, that is somehow, oh, wow, you have turned a new leaf. You have found inspiration or something. You don't realize, as a non-musician, how it was latent. It was growing all along. It was there. You weren't seeing it. It only affected you because that, that, that personal emotional response is so... It is, it is like a, f a flip, an either-or inside ourselves. But that's not helpful from the standpoint of the student learning who isn't there yet. And it's not helpful to think of in terms of the teacher who's trying to get them from almost to now, yes, they're affecting everybody. Evoking each mood and emotion. So one of the things, I demonstrated this a little bit last time, but I'll also just mention that in, in seminar class, uh, Nathan and the other dozen cellists, one of the games that we'll do from time to time, we'll just draw, well, they're in Italian because Italian, everything sounds cooler in Italian. We use it's our language in music. But so it'll be, you know, con fuoco or something or, or, or uh, doloroso, but it translates, it means sad. So if you drew doloroso and you're supposed to play a particular passage sad, you know what to do with your hands to make a sad sound. And the rest of the students who didn't see what you drew out of the hat say, hmm, sad? Yeah, all right. You know what I mean? We make a game out of it, much like you would in an acting class. Highlighting the form, the structure, the plot. We have to know where we are. Have you ever been lost in a movie? You know, maybe you had to run to get more popcorn or something, or sometimes we even get lost in a book. You left your bookmark there, and you're reading again, and you're going, what is, oh, that's right, this is a flashback. And you have to realize what's going on for it to make any sense at all. I think it's even more incumbent on us in the, in the art of music because music is, it is a language. It's just not the sort of language that you can go look up the meanings of the equivalence of words in a, in a dictionary. So as a performer, I have to do all the more to, to just really make as overt as possible where you are in the form at, at any moment. And if I, if I just make it unmistakable, because most people don't listen to music actively. They'll watch a movie actively, but they'll listen to music at least somewhat passively. So I have to, I have to breach through their thought process of, I need bread and eggs and what? You know, to get to them and let them know, oh, here's the beginning again, but in a different, in a different light. And if I succeed through their kind of passivity in keeping them aware of what was going on with the structure of it, they will call me talented. I have to hit them over the head with what's going on at any given time. Then they're more likely to be moved. 
All right, imitation and then variation. So we hear things, we hear great performers that all of us would agree are inspired and absolutely are talented. And we, we imitate them. Human beings are very good at imitating things. And then we vary it a little bit. So if, if for, for Nathan just started working on the Sanson Concerto, and maybe his, he likes Yo-Yo Ma's tempo and Yana Starker's dynamics and uh, Lynn Harrell's articulations or something. So he imitates each of those, alters them just a little bit, mixes them together. You can't, now it doesn't sound like any one of the three, no matter how well, because he's, he's created his own blend, but it still has that level of artistry to it. You know, a lot of, a lot of jazz players will do this, where they, they try to really sound like this player, and then they move on to sounding like that player. Uh, all right, ex experimentation, the willingness to try something new. This can be, I would relate this a little bit to indecision, where some people who are indecisive, they need to keep, I guess I, I, indecisive people, when they come to me as indecisive people, I have them do proactively more experimentation than other students because we have to kind of keep trying out more choices than what are normally coming to our brain. We're not just always going to do what we've always done. We're gonna find more options. And then each time we do, we're gonna step back after trying something five different ways, eight different ways, 10 different ways, and evaluate them. Well, I liked this best for this, I liked this best for that. Because it's that ability to have evaluated it before you're on stage that's going to allow you just to feel as though you are playing naturally from the heart when you are on stage, because you know cause and effect already, you know? When you first go out on that basketball court and you just hurl the ball, wow, that was nowhere close. So you're experimenting. Maybe if I try this, maybe if I try that. But at some point, you have to, if you want to be this good of a basketball player, you have to segue from experimenting to knowing. Now I've done enough experimenting that I know, no, that's not quite going to be enough, is it? And you know, you know before you throw the ball where it's going to go. But you don't get there without the experimentation. All right. Um, I thought I moved this. No, no, okay, okay, great. Sorry. A different part of the, the presentation I thought it was. So my three cello teachers, I want to I wanna give them credit. They are the reason why I teach like I teach, why I play like I play. And in they're very different people from each other, but they all really had uh, played a, a major role in me thinking about how I teach talent, how I teach skills, how I teach art. So Evan Tonsing there on your right was um, a professor at Oklahoma State University and at Amarillo, Texas. Uh, Phyllis Young was at University of Texas at Austin and George Nykrug at Boston University. Just a little bit about each of the three of them. Evan Tonsing was actually originally accepted when he was in college as a theater major. And this really came through in his teaching. He was always teaching acting as much as he was teaching cello playing. Uh, life itself was art for Evan Tonsing. There was never a moment when the art stopped. He was always in a performance. Everything was the performance still going on. Which if you think about it, if you take that view how do you get nervous when you just go out on stage in what is a continuous artistic experience? Do you know what I mean? It's no different. There's just brighter lights and they're going to applaud afterwards. You know, As opposed to right now, I'm day to day and I'm not in artistic. And now it's something special. Now it's this museum piece that's supposed to be different, right? And rhetoric, rhetoric, the art of persuasion. We're trying to persuade you to have this or that emotional response through our sounds, just through vibrating the air. So studying rhetoric, what is it that makes for persuasive, persuasive speech? And paralleling, finding the parallels in pure sound. All right, so in Phyllis Young's approach, she was very much into imagery and metaphor. 
So the like the physicist Richard Feynman was was very much into why would I learn something? Why would I reinvent the wheel, as we say, learn something from scratch when I can find something that I already do that's very much like what I'm trying to do and think, oh, this is just this, but this, you know, and I'm transferring existing skills. So it could be instead of talking about pronation on the cello, we talk about opening a doorknob or pouring some water on some plants or something that you are already good at, already naturally good at and never get nervous at doing. We don't have to um, like pretend that we're starting from scratch on any of this. And then, yeah, transference of skills. So I covered both those bullets. And then George Nykrug, like I say, he was the one who really regularly used this expression of manufacturing talent. He studied with Constantine Dunas. That may be a name that nobody in here knows, but Constantine Dunas was uh, himself both a surgeon and a violinist and was really active in what we now call performance medicine, the ways of healthily using the body before it was kind of a big thing with Alexander Technique and all sorts of, fortunately, it's proliferated a lot since his time. Physiology, healthy body use, how does the body want to be used to accomplish this or that or the other in a, in a way that it won't um, tax us over time? Removing inhibitions, removing barriers, finding ways that when we first start to do something, we're, in, we're, we're actually making things harder for ourselves than when we get very proficient at it. So the streamlining and simplifying, he'd, he'd tell this story of, you know, or story, he'd ask a student to imagine if you've ever seen a young child learning how to, to play tennis. And the way that they'll often swing a racket, well, maybe even their face smushes up, and they're using all sorts of muscles that have nothing to do with the motion of the racket. And then over time, they find that they don't need to do this, and they don't even need to do that after a while. And as they get better at it, they're using fewer and fewer muscles, right? So in a way, nice little irony here, when I'm spending hours a day, hours a week, practicing, I'm, I'm, I'm working, I've never worked so hard to be lazy. On stage, I want to feel like I'm being lazy, right? Because that's how the virtuoso comes across. Like, oh, I'm sorry, was this hard for you? I, it's easy for me. But I have, to, I have to find, oh, wait, I'm doing this, and that was unnecessary too. And I keep doing less and less, not more and more with each hour of practice. Mm -hmm. Demonstration, Nathan. All right. Nathan Ott is a freshman uh, microbiology major. Cello's not just for majors anymore, right? You're welcome, no matter what your background, we'll, we'll take you in the, the cello studio. But is a very fine cellist as well. So let's see, where shall we start? Nathan, let's just, and, and he has no idea. He asked me as we were driving over, like, are you going to tell me anything about it? We're like, no, because I want to be able to say, hey, Nathan, do you know what I'm going to do? And he gets to say, nope. <laughs> All right, so what if, what, if we just try, what if we just try playing a two-octave C major scale as fast as you can? And back down, up and down. Great, 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 great. So I'm going to come over to this side. So if we just, without the bow even, if we just drum our fingers, we're going to do so by going from the first finger to the fourth finger. And you just, no, don't even think about individual fingers, right? We're just drumming our hand. And even if it helps to take the thumb off, right, for just drumming. You see how that's tenser than if you're just drumming. Drum on the side of your cello. You see how that loose that, that can be. It's no different even the C string, right? And then we're going to go over to the different strings. Right. Don't even necessarily think about landing on specific individual strings. That's the work of the bow. And then the bow is going to go like this. That's all. Yeah. Right, so now. Right, right. You're still thinking individual pitches, aren't you? Drum them on one string. Right, right. So you are, you're still thinking individual pitches, right? As opposed to drumming your fingers. 
drumming your fingers is something that we just do when we're waiting for the cello professor to move on to the next topic. <laughs> drum, 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 drum. Yeah, so the, the thumb isn't involved when we're dr drumming our fingers, right? So no. Right, now go across the strings. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's better, that's better. How about, uh, pick a note, let's just do the D string. How, f how many, how fast can you play a whole bunch of up bows in a row? Right, right, right. So that up bow staccato is a fancy stroke that some people say, oh, you can either do it or you can't do it. So now would you do tremolo? So we're gonna speed up that up bow staccato. Would you do tremolo? Great. Now with the tremolo, I'm gonna push you this way while you go, right? You see what I mean? Go to back to tremolo at the tip. And if I put you, uh, but I have to find the rate at which you're tremoloing, right? Yeah, now you try that. This, this muscle is the enemy. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the, you're gonna have a little bit more of this. <laughs> but you're not thinking of his tremolo anymore. A really fast, nervous, cold, cold day like last week. Right, 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 right. Da, 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 da. Yeah, 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 good. Can you try, let's hear, I'm just pick pick a, a, a scale, and what if you just play, let's just, we could just stay with the same C major scale, and would you play it in an angry fashion, a slow C major scale angrily? Great, great. Now, can you play it, play it sadly? What would a sad C major scale sound like? And what would a mysterious C major scale sound like? We gotta keep those open strings, they're gonna pop out, they're gonna be brighter, right? Try that again. And the vibrato as well, think about the vibrato as well. We draw things out of a hat, again, like actors. Are actors deceiving us? Are they deceiving us when they pretend to, you know, care about to be or not to be, if that's not really what's on their mind? No, we want, it's their job to transport us to whatever their lines are, whatever their lines mean. And it's our job to transport you to whatever the notes mean, whatever on the notes on the page suggest. So, for example, Let's say, I don't know, have you ever played the swan before? Oh, you have? All right. See, I can't, if I don't want him to know, I can't even ask him what pieces he's played before, he'll, or he'll know. But it's been a while? It's been a while. All right. Play me that first, here, I'm going to set it to where it is. The first, just that first phrase of the swan, if you would. That's already good, that's already good. He was good when he came to me, and he's, a, he's quick on the uptake, too. Um, so what if, we, what if we see if we can make that even more expressive? Let's do, let's do a, um, actually, let's play onto the B this time. And let's come down there and then go back up there. And let's no vibrato here, and then add the vibrato here writing backwards upside down. <laughs> Can you read that? <laughs> All right. Keep going. Cool, cool. And let's let's do the same thing. We're not going to start the vibrato until here. That's where the vib starts after the note. And we're going to wait to there to crescendo. We're going to day crescendo it first, right? So that this is going to be very quiet. And now here, use more bow and use more bow there, right? Give this note a little bit of extra something. In fact, let's do the same thing here. Let's do that. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I don't mean to keep it a mystery if anybody wants to see what markings I put up here, but that's not really the point. The point is that in lessons, we're always taking a line of music that at first, I mean, very often, it sounds good. It sounds perfectly good. But it's like, are we going to move everybody? Are we going to move everybody? You know, those sayings politicians say, you can't please everybody all the time. Out on stage as music performers, I want everybody to have goosebumps, you know, which isn't easy. So we have to keep looking for more ways to push more of your buttons. Let's just try one more. And I mean, we can do more than this still if people want to see more examples. You're going to love this. Have you ever played the Dvorak Concerto? Ah. <laughs> He's like, what have I gotten into? Here, check out this nasty spot. Um, here. Da -da 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 in octaves, yeah, yeah. You want to give it a try? And then we're going to make it easy. We're going to make it easy peasy. Right, right, right. Oh, it's, it's nasty. So the, you, and you, I bet you see this coming. We're first just going to take um, the top line and we're going to play a chromatic scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right. That's it. On the b right to the B. I, I stopped too soon, didn't I? Right. Now do that all on third finger. It'll just be a slide. No, no, you don't, you don't even need to try and make the discrete pitches. Just do as a continuous portamento. Right, right. Now, and do that again and consciously make sure the thumb is trailing behind on the, on the D string the whole time. It's just riding along. Uh-huh, very good, very good. And then with the bow, we're going to do this. Put the bow on the string and go, see, because the last is a grouping of four. That's six plus six plus seven. So we have to go... <laughs> Three da 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 da. Uh, open Just open string. Start on a start on an up bow so that the last one will be a down. Right, right. One more time. A little bit firmer wrist. Yeah, that time you make sure you start on an up. Now you go. Just the A string without the thumb to begin with. Yeah, close, close. So it's up to the bow to cut off you know, the chromatic scale. And the left hand will just be just a portamento. Right, just a portamento. No, no, yeah, yeah. here, just do this. Yeah, that's your motion of your left hand. Yeah, a little too high, but no. Now, and with the thumb. Yeah, see, don't think of it as octaves. It's not. It's a portamento. Yeah, like, like that. The Dvorak Concerto, I don't know if you know this or not, but it's kind of, it's the triple dog dare of the concertos. Ooh. So, <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, he can uh, get back at me later if he wants to. Like, Wait, you're having me read all the, the Dvorak Cello Concerto? But the cool thing is, is that if, if I, as a teacher, am thinking about ways to just take parallels from things that I already see a student do. Oh, well, I can apply that to this. I can help you apply that to that. And find ways to lay the groundwork so that by the time he does start working on the Dvorak Concerto, it's almost, it's almost ridiculously easy. It's like, this is the vaunted Dvorak Concerto? Where's all the difficulty that I was, I was ready, I was braced for it to be? 
Are you wanting it to be difficult? Sometimes when people use the word talent, it's like, is it that they don't want to acquire something because I've created this distance between me, the untalented, and those people who are talented? Then I don't have to consider maybe I ought to put in the time to work on that and get there myself. Uh, so we can do more things if we want. Actually, can we have a round of applause for the amazing Nathan Ott? <laughs> Woo! Way to go, Nathan. So, and we can, you know, hours of fun, hours of fun. I do hours of this each week, and I get paid for it. It's my job. I love it. It's amazing. So the, the 10,000 hour rule, the thing about, I'll combine both these bullets. The thing is that the, the difference very often between the little kid who can't have been playing violin for more than 500 hours, who's nailing the Paganini caprices, and somebody who's spent 80,000 hours and still can't even play one of them anywhere near tempo. One of the things you look at is who is studying with that teacher, or that teacher, or that teacher? How come it is that everybody who goes to this particular teacher gets the jobs that they want and plays amazingly? Is that, it was that genetic that they were going to go study with that teacher? Do you know what I mean? So what is it that these teachers are doing if not manufacturing talent? You go to them and now you come away being declared talented by all in the expression and in the execution of things. So if that's not uh, proof that it can be learned, what we really need is we as teachers need an attitude towards this, this thing called talent where we keep an open mind about what it is that the, that the student may be doing incorrectly, un, not ideally, whether intentionally or not. So I do a, a weekly series called Cello Chat with, with cellists from all over the globe and um, one that's coming up, I actually pre-recorded it, I know, so it's not live. Um, but it was with a cello professor in New Zealand and she has been studying this scientific way of uh, it's called SEMG, of being able to tell which muscles are being used to do various things, which muscles are you actually using. Sometimes there'll be a muscle just not doing anything that would have been helpful had you used it. And you think, well, why aren't you using it? Because the brain is not used to asking that muscle to do that or the other, you know? And the brain isn't going to do things it's not going to use muscles that it's just not even aware of. And the muscle is never going to say, hey, what about me? That's not part of the process for the, the muscle to try and, and get your attention. Um, I hope that makes sense. So are there questions? I started at age 10 in fifth grade in my uh, public school system in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Stillwater, Stillwater, Oklahoma. Yeah, go Cowboys. Yes. I I still am, I still am. I want to demonstrate as a teacher the same willingness to experiment that I'm asking of my students. So there are times that we try something and we go, well, that didn't work. You know what I mean? But that's important too. That's it. So, and, and often the, I'll have my own list of things that I think are going to help a student, let's say, who wants a, a particular different type of vibrato or something like that. And in my mind, it's going to be either thing number one or number two that's going to work. Sometimes it's thing three or four because, I mean, I, I don't feel what they're feeling and there will be some sort of a, as, as out in the open as the, the muscles are that we're using by and large in playing cello, unlike, you know, you can't see what's going on in the mouth of a clarinet or oboe player or something. But there's still stuff that I'm not 100% aware of that they're doing. But we can certainly try various approaches. Well, then if you do it, but this way, but that way, oh, that's much more difficult. Well, why? And, and we just keep unearthing. It's a little bit of, 
it feels like sleuthing, really, like um, like a Sherlock Holmes sort of a thing. Well, why would you be able to do it in this case, but not in this case? Hmm. And it's it's frankly, I mean, it's if it becomes a fun challenge, not only to me but to the student, then they're much more likely to get out the cello every day and practice more because that's vastly more interesting than than Sudoku or or video games or anything, is to try and think, oh, wait, wait, how do I get that even clearer, even faster, even higher? It's fascinating. Yeah. How would you say that quality of the instrument is fascinating? It does. It clearly does. But I think how, how the quality of the instrument factors into uh, a student's perceived playing level, I think there are there's a quality below which it's it's not good it's not good at all there are some instruments out there or instrument like objects that just are you know here may i try that on your instrument oh wow how are you getting any sound out of this fortunately they're not at, as common as you might think most instruments are in the playable range and one of the things i think it's easy to attribute too much to the quality of the instrument because if you hear Yo-Yo Ma pick up any old instrument, he sounds like Yo-Yo Ma. It's like, oh, he's playing on a Stradivarius. Oh, have him pick up anything, hand him anything, and ask him to play anything, and it will be drop-dead gorgeous. And then you play the instrument, how do you do that? You know what I mean? It's like, eh, I, there's only so much that we can credit the instrument for. Yeah, there is another hand. We do have time for another question or two, or uh, Dr. Rickham can stay a bit if you'd like to talk with him one-on-one, yeah. -on -one. or maybe we could hear a little more music as we exit, yeah. something <laughs> like that. Um, but for the lecture piece, that that we'll, we'll call that sure. a close, and please join me in thanking Benjamin Wickham and Thank Nathan. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. And Nathan. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>